Hello, this is Joy News Prime with me, MFA Apau. In this hour, the conflicting figures provided by the government on how much judgment debt it has paid so far. Total, we have had no choice but to pay as much as 42% of the outstanding, which is about 283 million CDs, which is approximately 94 million CDs yearly. We have exclusive details from a joint news RTI request, placing the figure at 125 million CDs, even though the finance minister had told parliament nearly 300 million CDs has been paid as of July 2019. Also this evening, notorious Chinese Galamse Queen Aisha Huang, who was deported for engaging in illegal mining, resurfaces in Ghana under a new identity. President Ekofado is hopeful Ghana will get an IMF program by the end of the year. Yes, that's our expectation as well. We're hoping to raise the money to do the adaptation. That's why we're here. More as we take you to the Netherlands for the update on the African Adaptation Summit focusing on climate change. And later, civil society groups hit the streets of Accra as they power pressure on the Auditor General to exercise its power of surcharge and disallowance. Really, there's no sense in going to the IMF when in one year, what the irregularities amount to is more than what we are going to IMF for. That fund was available today. It, 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 it will be able to build at least 160 primary schools. We're digging now, and this evening, Finance Minister Ken Ofurieta on July 12, 2019, told Parliament government had since 2017 paid as much as 283 million CDs as judgment did. A joint news RTI request to the Finance Ministry places the figure since 2017 at 125 million CDs. Well, this raises questions about the accuracy of the data the Finance Ministry gave Parliament. Payment of judgment debt was topical prior to the 2016 polls as then an opposition NPP listed such payments as examples of corruption. Our research desk correspondent Joseph Akable has more on this particular thorny issue. You would not be able to run away from the conclusion that this is a deliberate attempt across government to take people's money. And it's not just where you're it's, just, it's not just where you're You look at what available. It is the same pattern. You look at uh, 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 the, the others. You can see a similar pattern. It cannot be inefficiency. Kweku decides to call it recklessness. It cannot be recklessness. Reckless it, it, it is deliberate. It is deliberate. It goes beyond people just being reckless. The words of the NPP's Nana Komia on News File on the Joy News Channel. This was on August 2, 2014. At a time, the NDC, led by John Dramani Mahamad, come under intense pressure to retrieve some 51.2 million city judgment debt from businessman Alfred Woyome. A host of other judgment debt payments had equally become the subject of heated public discussions. B is interest on the sum from 2008. Not about this. No, 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 listen, listen, no, listen, no, listen. He's, he's, he's married to no, no, the same. no, I'm, I am talking about oranges. You are talking, you about, are not I'm getting, talking about because his question was that has the Supreme he's Court not getting the drift. Let me finish. No, I, then you I can challenge me. Question. You are not the uh, when I finish, it therefore came as no surprise that a subject found expression in the MPP's 2016 manifesto. Page 134.f provided as follows. Payments of dubious judgment debts and questionable settlements. The party promised as follows. The NPP will fight corruption head-on through preventive, detective, corrective and punitive actions. Our anti-corruption policy will be based on three key pillars. Institutional reform, legislative reform and attitudinal change or public education. The NPP has since taken over government. Joy News has been tracking the thorny issue of judgment debts. A right to information request was first sent to the Office of the Attorney General and Minister of Justice. The office responded that the appropriate place to obtain this information was the Finance Ministry. A subsequent request was therefore sent to the Finance Ministry where the information was provided. Information from the Finance Ministry reveals that government has since 2017 paid judgment debts totaling 125 million cities. The highest judgment debt was paid in 2018. An amount of 30.9 million cities was paid to Jubilee Tractors and Assembly Plants Limited. This arose from a case filed against the National Security Council. In 2017, an amount of 29.5 million cities was paid NDK Financial Services. The reasons for these payments was not stated and Joinees has been unsuccessful in attempts to unravel it. A close comparison of the various years shows that the highest amount paid since the NPP government took over was in 2017 when payments totaled 54 million cities. 
A 2021 research published by the Center for Social Justice shows that this 125 million CD figure compares nowhere near the whooping 356.6 million CDs debt paid by the NDC administration in 2010. It, however, ranks higher when what was paid in the first four years of the John Muhammad administration is compared to the first four years of the Akufado administration. A total judgment debt of 69.9 million cities was paid by the NDC administration between 2013 and 2016. President Akufado's government between 2017 and 2020 paid 120 of the 125 million cities judgment debt paid so far. 2.8 million cities judgment debts have so far been paid by government this year. These figures are remarkably lower than what the finance minister told parliament in July 2019. At the time, he put total judgment debts paid so far at 283 million cities. The government's approach is to renegotiate most of these judgment debts and ensure that we make as much savings as possible and continue to protect the public purse. For example, in one instance, we managed to save the taxpayer some 90 million Ghana cities through renegotiations. In another instance, we negotiated a savings of 130 million on a claim of over 180 million. In total, we have had no choice but to pay as much as 42% of the outstanding, which is about 283 million CDs, which is approximately 94 million CDs yearly, due to the threat of garnishing of our accounts and the renegotiations held. It is not clear what may have accounted for this clear discrepancy. Let's go on Zoom now and research desk um, person. We have uh, Joseph Akable uh, joining me uh, via Zoom now this evening with more on this. Joseph, we know this issue came up in Parliament. What were the specific figures that were given by the minister? The minister specifically mentioned the amount of 283 million cities. In fact, he described that payment as at July uh, July 2019 as being 40 percent of the claims that government had received, the claims were in excess of 400 million cities. And he did make the point that uh, in terms of their negotiations and attempting uh, to defend some of those actions, it had come to the figure of 283 million cities, which is what had been paid. And he put the average payment per year at about 94 million cities. Okay, now we know this was in 2019, and it captured the period starting from 2017. We have figures on 2017 and 2019. What do we know? And so first, we need to make the point that our figures that we have uh, is unlike what he provided in Parliament. In fact, in Parliament, the concern was that he didn't give a breakdown of who the beneficiaries of these judgment debts are. We have details of the beneficiaries of all the judgment debts paid from 2017 to 2022. And it comes to a total of 125.3 million cities. That is from 2017 till date and including even what was paid this year. And so far this year, 2.8 million cities have been paid. And so the total of 125 million cities, as we can all bear out, is way lesser than the figure of 283 million cities which the minister gave as far back as July 2019. And so the point is, if we've been paying more since then, why is the figure lesser? Now let's go a bit back and look at the yearly figures. Uh, again, because he made a point about the averages of 94 million cities, there's not even a single year from the data that government paid anything that is close to the figure of uh, 50 million cities. In fact, it's only in 2017 that a total of 54 million cities was paid out of nine line items or nine judgment debt payments that the government had to pay. Some of them were paid in favor of one Albert or say There was one in judgment debt in respect of the Republic versus the command of Sagan Air Force Company. One also paid NDK Financial Services. One Moses K. Yabwa. One paid as a result of a smaller limited suing the Ministry of Roads, among others. And so we have all those details. So the total figure for 2017 is 54 million cities. If you go to the figure in 2018, where you had uh, nine payments that were made, various line items, key amongst them is one that arose as a result of Jubilee Tractors and Assembly Plant Limited suing the National Security Council. The total payment of 30.9 million cities was made in that one line item. But the total for that particular year, the whole of 2018, came to 35 million cities. When we go over to 2019, out of 11 payment items, the total came to 13.9 million cities. And note, MFI was in 2019 that the minister was speaking. And so even if you pick 2019, the 30 million, and go back to 35 million for 2018, and go back to 54 million 
for 2017 is nowhere near the 283 that the minister mentioned. Mm -hmm. So if you go on to add that of 2020, which comes to uh, 2020, is the amount of 18.9 million cities. And with that of 2022 being 2.8 million cities, we come to a total of 125.3 million cities. Okay. We are still nowhere near the amount that was mentioned by the minister as far back as July 2019. Interesting details there, but Joseph, stay with me via Zoom. I have other issues I would want to delve deeper into with you, but let's stay on this issue uh, shortly. Uh, and we have Ni Ama Adi, he's with the Center for Social Justice. He also joins us via Zoom. Thank you very much uh, for joining us, Ni Ama. So I know that this issue about judgment debt was very topical uh, during the election period, but you've done some work, especially on judgment debt payments, spanning 20 years. Does it come as a surprise that since 2017, 125 million cities have been paid. Yes, it comes as a big surprise. I mean, good evening to uh, viewers. It comes as a very big surprise because um, if the minister has said something in parliament and your own research is also pointing to a different figure, then it comes as a big surprise. Is that where do we tend to? Who do we believe? Is this the RTI? Is it what we at the Center for Social Justice got from the Auditor and Accountant General report? I mean, where do we think? Hmm. So really, it's a surprise. But and it means that somebody is not telling us the truth. Well, but I, I don't know what the suspicion could be and what the challenge could be in terms of the conflicting figures that we're getting. But I would want to test your polls on what exactly you make of this particular conflicting figures. What does it say to you? I mean, I, I, would want to, I would not want to assume anything, but I mean, where we have politics of everything, where we have a, a financial crisis at the doorstep of the country, and where one would want to put things in a way that everything is all right, we only forget that things really truth buried shall surely rise. And that is the situation that we've seen, because he, I don't think that the president, the minister was... Uh, conjecturing figures when he met parliament and he, he said all what he said. So it is just a matter of time that we have the truth at hand. So what the next thing we'll ask is now the minister has told parliament a different thing. RTI has given a different figure. We want to ask him in order for fans to say that these are the disparity in figures that we have for the same issues. Where is the difference coming from? Let's hear from him then we can have a balanced view of things. So for you, uh, the minister ought to answer further questions on this particular conflicting figure. But there are those who also have uh, the concern about, looks like there's a cartel when it comes to this particular judgment date issue, for which reason it becomes very topical when it becomes a political campaigning amongst others. Going forward, what ought to be the way for you? I mean, what ought to be the way is that we have to be very careful with our eyes and ears widely open to find out the reasons that causes judgment debts. Okay, if there is an assumption that there is a cartel, which means that those people are known. I mean, for instance, the research by Mr. Cable points out to the beneficiaries of those judgment debts. Who are they? Once we can find them, that means that we can question them. Let's put them to strict questioning. And let's find out where the document that supports whatever is purported to have done, where are those documents? And I'm saying that if there are ways that we can get to the bottom of matters, then we have to do it. We cannot leave the AG's office out of this because every judgment that every contract that the, the state goes into, it involves the Attorney General's office. And I've read where the Attorney General is telling us that they are prosecuting over 850 million uh, 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 money, 850 million that has, I mean, heaped up on the country. Okay, okay. Would also come up with what these things are involved. But yes, to your question again, you have what you call contractual bridges, where you go into contract and then you breach the contract. Okay, where you have statutory obligations which are not held in high esteem as it's supposed, that we do public service work the way we will not do our own work because the monies are not coming from us. Where we do not follow strictly and also where government do not have money,
but it goes into projects and okay. not knowing where the money comes from. We're we'll, we'll I mean, leave we it here, think... Niyama. We are grateful, indeed. We are grateful for your time. That's Niyama Adi, who's a centre for social justice there, joining us on this particular development when it comes to the RTI and what we've been able to get with the judgment debt payment over the period 2017 alone, 125 million. There's more of that on myjoinonline.com. But on to some other issues now. And the notorious Chinese Galamse Queen, who was deported for engaging in illegal mining, is back at it. Aisha Huang is what I'm talking about. And she's resurfaced in Ghana under a new identity after slipping back into the country through the Togo border. She was, however, arrested last week upon intelligence by the National Security. You recall that Aisha Huang was in 2017 charged with undertaking small-scale mining operations contrary to the law. However, she was deported in 2018, a move that attracted widespread public criticism. In April 2019, during an interaction with Ghanaians in the U.S., Former senior minister Yao Safumafo justified why government decided against prosecuting Aisha Wang, but rather deported her to China. Well, following her arrest last week, she was put before an Accra High Court and fresh charges filed against her. Staying with me on Zoom is our court correspondent, Joseph Akable. He followed the court proceedings and stays with us on Zoom with more. Joseph, what are the facts of the case as we know it? So the prosecutors in the facts of the case to the court, they do indicate and recount a bit of what you have touched on so far about the fact that she had earlier been arrested and charged in here before our courts and escaped prosecution in the sense that she was deported. And so they make the point that according to their investigations in terms of the initial investigation and what it has uncovered so far, it indicates that once she got back to her country, she did change her identity and also managed to make some key changes that enable her to be able to acquire a visa and enter Togo, after which she slipped into our country and went back to the Ashanti region. You recall when she was arrested and deported at the Ashanti region, specifically the Amansi area, where the areas where she carried out her Galamsi activities. Uh, the prosecutors say that once she slipped into the country, she went back to that particular area and continued with the sale of mining equipment as well as engaging in the illegal mining that she was engaging in prior to her arrest and deportation. Uh, they say that national security picked up intelligence and moved in and apprehended her and now proceeded to bring her to the court. So we know her as Aisha Wang, interesting revelation there that he, she changed her identity. So what name is she operating under? By the court documents, she's referred to as Wang Ruxia, and they add the alias, which we all know to be Aisha Wang to it. And this is a different name from the name she had in the previous occasions when she was arrested and put before our courts. And was she in court herself? And we know the charges that have been uh, proffered against her. And so today was the second court session. She was in court last Friday. That's the very first time where she and two other accused persons were apprehended and taken over to the circuit courts. Now, on Friday, when the charges were to be read, the plea could not be taken because there wasn't any, a Chinese interpreter available to explain to her the reason for her being in court. And so the court agenda matter to today to enable that interpreter to be available. Unfortunately, today she was not present in court. We understand she's still in custody, but the other two individuals who were charged alongside her were brought over to the court. And this time around, an interpreter was available. The charges were read and they entered a not guilty plea. And so uh, they've been remanded into custody. They are to reappear on the 14th of September. Joseph Akable, thank you very much. That's our court correspondent bringing us details of that latest, uh, we know, arrest of Aisha Wan. We're told she's resurfaced in the country. We'll be following that and bring you more. Now let's head to the Netherlands. And President Ekofado says he's hopeful that Ghana will get an IMF program by the end of this year. He said this in an interview with Benjamin Akako at the first ever African Adaptation Summit in Rotterdam, Netherlands. Mr. President, you're welcome to Rotterdam. Uh, very quick questions. So what are your expectations as head of the Climate Vulnerable Forum? And uh, I spoke to Kristalina, uh, head of the, uh, the IMF, and she indicated that uh, they are hoping that you can get an IMF program, our country, by the end of year. Quick responses? Yes, that's our expectation as well. And uh, ahead of the program, what are you hoping uh, to achieve for the Climate we're, Vulnerable Forum in five we're, countries? We're hoping to raise the money to do the adaptation. That's Maybe why one, we're uh, here. quick statement, uh, can I just add uh, to the president? We're extremely humbled having a President Akufo Addo here at this Weed Leaders Summit. Why? 
President Akufo-Addo has been on the climate agenda for many, many years. He has the plan through the African Adaptation Acceleration Program, but he also has the leadership and the commitment. So today is a big day. Failure or success is, is money flowing to Africa? Failure of success is, is money flowing to Ghana? And there is no other way. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Christina Gogiva, has also um, spoken to Benjamin Akakwe. He noted how her office is determined to ensure an agreement is reached for Ghana by the end of the year. Kristalina Gogiva added that the $3 billion needed by the government of Ghana is yet to be decided. I speak on behalf of my institution, the International Monetary Fund. Promises we make, we keep. We made the promise to mobilize uh, resilience and sustainability trust and start with at least 40 billion we have delivered on this promise and among the first countries to be beneficiaries will be African countries uh, and I would uh, call on everyone recognize that it is a promise you m you must meet for your own people climate change is hitting everybody everywhere and it is undermining global security. Uh, to your second question, uh, I am uh, very uh, determined for us to indeed reach an agreement by the end of this year. We started very constructive uh, discussions already uh, and uh, uh, to the people of Ghana, like everybody on, uh, on this planet, you have been hurt by exogenous shocks. First the pandemic, then Russia's war in Ukraine. And that we need to realize is not because of bad policies in the country, but because of this combination of shocks. And therefore, we have to support Ghana because you're a member, you're a strong country, you have fantastic people, but also we have to support Ghana because your strength contributes to the strength of your neighbors. It contributes to a stronger world. We asked for 1.5 billion initially. Now they're asking for 3 billion. Will we get it? Let's go through the discussions and then we will know. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. Welcome back and thanks for staying with us here on the Joy News Prime. And this evening, Office of the Auditor General has agreed to meet CSOs to discuss ways to go after individuals and organizations cited for the financial infractions in excess of 60 million CDs. Now, this comes after the CSOs picketed the Auditor General's office to issue surcharges in accordance with the Constitution. In 2021, the Auditor General, John Sinequia Moesiedu, issued only one surcharge. The groups have been piling pressure on the AG to do more with a promise to go the full length of the law should he fail to recover public funds that have been misappropriated. My colleague Michael Ashali was there. Here's his report. The protest is organized by the Citizens Coalition. First, as the rain threatened to disperse the crowd, protesters were also barred from converging at the Ifwa Sutherland Park. Um, we are having uh, this uh, difficulty with the security man here. He says, um, He's been getting, given instruction that um, we don't have the appropriate permission or whatever to converge here, so they shouldn't allow us in. But they were determined, ready to picket the Auditor General's office. According to them, the Auditor General's refusal to issue surcharges is harming the state. In 2021 alone, financial irregularities by state institutions amounted to 17.4 billion cities. Executive Director of Africa Education Watch Kofi Asari says the Auditor General Johnson Esiedu must do more than just produce reports. In 2020 alone, more than 80 million Ghana cities of funds in the education sector were a subject of misapplication and irregularities. In the previous year, it was even higher. The, the point is that we can't continue pouring water in a leaking basket if we really aim to provide quality basic education and secondary education for every Ghanaian child. Hold the persons responsible for the financial irregularities to account. And those that must refund to the state, let them refund to the state. Otherwise, these funds, shortly, if they are recovered, what would it mean for the educational space? If the 18 billion Ghana cities 
and over. That went into financial regularities, okay? If that fund was available today, it, 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 it will be able to build at least 160 primary schools. Let me tell you one thing. There are 5,000 schools today taking place under trees in Ghana. And there are 4,000 primary schools that do not have a junior high school. The Citizens Coalition is planning to drag the Auditor General to court if he fails to issue set charges. Adam Senanu is an anti-corruption campaigner. Really, there's no sense in going to the IMF when in one year what the irregularities amount to is more than what we are going to the IMF for. So what's the logic? 17 billion in 2021 and you're going to the IMF for about 16 billion. It doesn't make sense. When you fail to obey what the Supreme Court really says, you can be taken to court and you can be jailed for that. So again, he's, he's moving us to a point where we'll be forced to go back to court to cite him of contempt of the Supreme Court, which then will lead to sanctions on him. So it's not just we are, we are giving him a red flag. This is a red flag. Though they were prevented from picketing the office of the Auditor General, the group marched from the Children's Park to the Blaster Square where the Deputy Auditor General, Lawrence Ayagiba, met and received their petition on behalf of the office. I acknowledge receipt of this petition on behalf of the Auditor General and the Audit Service. You know, I want to thank you for coming and the peaceful manner in which you have exhibited this demonstration. We want to assure you that we as Ghana Oil Service acknowledge and in fact agree to all what you are doing. We have a common goal that we need to fight to make sure that every city is accounted for. That is why we have actually exposed and publicized our reports. We have agreed with management for another meeting somewhere on Friday where we'll sit down and agree on the way forward. So on behalf of the Auditor General and on behalf of every Ghanaian, I want to thank you for drawing our attention to this and to assure you that all the concerns that you have raised will be addressed. Director of Advocacy at the Center for Democratic Development, Dr. Gimano Kojo Asante says the group will continue to power pressure on the Auditor General to recover all funds misappropriated. They agree with us what we are asking for and they are committed to meet us on Friday to have a full discussion about the issues that we have raised. So that is for us an important step. We will now have that meeting and when we have that meeting, Whatever the outcome of that meeting, we'll also communicate to the public, all the citizens who have joined us, so that they are informed of the actions that are being taken. But for us, uh, the issue is very simple. All the issues that uh, we are talking about are in the reports. So we need to make sure that every single issue in the report that has been raised is being addressed, and we want an update on it. And that's what we have to focus on. The meeting will take place on Friday, September 9, 2022. For Joy News, Michael Ashali. Now, Deputy Minority Leader James Kluche Aveji is fighting off claims about a possible compromise of the leadership of his side in parliament. He insists the Haruna Idrisu led leadership has given off its best under the current circumstances. Compromise. You are not? No. You have not been influenced by government? Nobody came to me that we are going to do A, B, C, D, take this and do this for us. Personally, nobody came to me. But if they did, if they did to the other, if they do to the other, they would, I wouldn't know. But I know my minority leader, Haruna Indesu. That is why I said I am not convinced and, and I'm not aware of this. I'm not sure this thing happened. Leadership of but the minority see, is not corrupt. No, no. I can tell you that we are not. We are not. Where I'm standing and where I'm sitting, we are not. So what reason have when you given you, to your members and even your grassroots to think that in, that's where you are, you are corrupt? You see, in politics, mm -hmm. people play many games. It is easy for the majority side to sow this seed among us, mm -hmm. okay? By calling some backbenchers of the minority side and say, hey, look, we have given so much to your leaders. And that alone will spark 
And that will bring that kind of discord between the leadership and the backbench. It's easy to do. Mm. If we're in government and we're in the same situation where the difference between the two parties is only one member, we also think something along that line. He insists the NDC is a better alternative while describing the governing NPP's Break the Eight mantra as mere sloganeering. Breaking the Eight, for me, is a slogan that they have adopted that they are breaking the Eight. It is their wish. It's just a slogan. It's a slogan. It's a slogan. You know, they are good in that uh, slogan thing. We'll do this, that, or that. So it's a slogan. But it's a people who decide whether they can break the eight or not. I remember those days when Kufo was campaigning. Uh, they said, look into your uh, your life. The same apply today. In 2024, Ghanaians, look into your standard of living, how you are suffering in terms of everything, and vote and vote this What's government. What's the standard out. of living? Our standard of living is very poor now. The cost of living is very high. Your salaries remain the same. The value has gone down drastically. Yet, you go to the market, you buy things at the very exorbitant prices. That affects your standard of living. There are things that you used to do, you cannot do them now. Because you don't have the means to do but it. But are you the best alternative, the NDC? All is of not course. Well. All is not well in your stable as well, is it? How? How? What is wrong with us? There is nothing wrong with that. In every big organization, you definitely have to have some small skirmishes. The issue is whether you're able to resolve them. Deputy Minister for Justice and Attorney General Dina Sonabadapa has dismissed claims that the plea bargain law does not favor the rich, explaining that it rather allows offenders to appeal their cause for either a reduced sentence or avoid prison sentence. And for the first time, the victim gets compensated. She's been speaking on legal education show, The Law, on the Joy News Channel. Now, if you look at Act um, 1079, it says that the accused person, there are three, there are two, the accused person or the prosecutor may initiate the plea bar, the plea negotiation. Okay. And there are no economic status considerations in the commencement of the plea negotiation. The law does not say that you have to be of a particular economic status before you can invoke um, this plea bargaining provision. And of course, there is a whole chain of people involved, including the victim, which I've mentioned, right. who may object to the terms of um, the plea ab agreement. And the court is obliged to invite and consider the objection of the victim. Mm. And again, it is not just between the prosecutor and the accused person to conclude the agreement and enforce it. Mm. The court may also decide to reject the plea ag agreement. And so again, empirically, I say that I find no basis for that assertion that plea bargaining is for the race. She gets further details about the critical role the victim plays in the process of getting justice for this new law. Restorative justice basically includes the victim right. in the whole process of the criminal justice delivery system. You know that in Ghana, when you commit a criminal offence, it is deemed to be an offence committed against the state. That's right. You, I mean, in the past, the, the interest or... Um, the, the, the interest of the victim was disregarded, if I can say it that way. Now, plea bargain, if you look at our provision, it enables the victim or the complainant or their representatives to make an input mm. into the plea um, agreement that is negotiated between the prosecutor and the accused person to the extent that, that the victim may even make representations to object to the terms of the plea agreement. And to the extent that the prosecutor shall not conclude a plea agreement without the involvement of the victim mm. or the complainant. Okay. And further, the court who supervises or superintends the whole plea agreement before enforcement is also charged to ensure, to invite, and in fact receive representations from the victim or complainant. Mm. And one of the um, results, the outcome of plea bargaining, is that the accused person may agree to pay compensation to the victim or to make restitution. Now imagine having to live your entire life differently as a result of an ailment that could have been easily treated that wasn't because of ignorance and financial problems. Well, you probably might have heard of similar tragic stories, but this 
is an incredibly heartbreaking one of a 25-year-old university student who's been suffering from rheumatism, a joint disease. Over time, his condition has worsened to the point that he's completely disabled. Jesse Boafo has a rest of Bismarck Ofori Opoku's story. Bismarck Ofori Opoku, a level 300 student of the Kibi Presbyterian College of Education, was diagnosed with rheumatism at a very tender age at the Dunkwa Ofin Government Hospital in the Central Region. My name is Ofori Bismarck Opoku. I'm 25 years of age, a student of KB Presbyterian College of Education in level 300. Um, it all started when I was a kid. I, I can't recall the exact age, but I was in class four. I went to the, I have rheumatism. While he was in class four, he visited the said hospital again on an account of a rheumatic episode and he was injected on the right buttock. After a fortnight, he started feeling pain in his right hip and this time, his mother rather resorted to rubbing a balm on the affected area which subsidized the pain but left him limping on his right leg after a month. So I went to the hospital and um, I was given injection on my right leg. So uh, after two weeks, I started feeling some pain at my head. So I complained to my mom. Uh, then uh, we, we did not go back to the hospital again. We just applied some balm on it. So um, later the pain stopped. Um, from there, about one month, I started limping on the right leg. The excruciating pain in Bismarck's right hip has completely immobilized him. The agony and the depression make Bismarck dread going through the night. I barely get enough sleep because of my brother's condition. He's unable to do anything by himself. We are humbly appealing to everyone to come to our aid. Indeed, no human deserves to go through such ordeal, he says. People always look at you differently because you are different from them. Sometimes they will be giving you names, even at college. I had to cope with the names and all that. But you can't beat them. You just have to be silent or whatever that you can say. You just say it and you go your way. His family took him to the St. Joseph Hospital in Koforidia, where the news about a total hip replacement costing 34,000 cities was broken to them. They said he would need a surgery, which cost 34,000. But my entire pension pay is even no match to the said amount. True charity is the desire to be useful to others with no thought of recompense. That's according to Emmanuel Swedenborg. Bismarck is in need of your help, your support. For Joy News, Jesse Sewa Boafo's report Right to you. We'll take a quick break here on Joy News Prime. We come back with Showbiz. And it's time for Showbiz on Prime. I get to do it all by myself today because Becky is unavailable. And Leila Jansi has been recognized by various international organizations for her continuous work in the field of women's rights advocacy through the art of filmmaking. Well, filmmaker Leila Jansi has been adv has advised Ghanaian movie makers to focus more on bringing out quality products in, uh, in order to compete effectively on the international market and put their ego aside. She's been speaking on a wide range of issues with George Quay when she appeared on Showbiz A to Z. Difficult working in Ghana. Yes. Why? What makes it difficult? What are the challenges? Um, a couple. I mean, first of all, it's fun. Mm -hmm. um, I, I got to put that out there that it's actually enjoyable because when I'm directing in Ghana, I don't feel like a black woman. Mm -hmm. So as for, I got to put that out there first. Mm -hmm. I blend in and, you know, I can, I don't have to mind my words mm -hmm. so much as opposed to directing in LA when I'm, I'm twirling my hair, have to like be careful that I'm not angry. You know, there are more restrictions. I'm, I'm more aware of myself when I direct, you know, 
in America. What, you cannot be angry when you're directing? I mean, a black woman, we have so many walls that wow. are built for us <laughs> that we don't build. Like, once you raise your voice, oh, you're aggressive. Oh, wow. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, even, I mean, I remember when I was working on Word Children Play, my DP, who was like my friend, he was my friend, and he said that. So I set up a shot, and then he looked at me and was like, Layla, you know what? For a girl, you're really smart. I'm like, that is not a compliment. <laughs> but he thought, he's Italian. What does he know? He thought he gave me a compliment. But wow. it was not a compliment. And I'm like, Pete, that was not a compliment. That's it for showbiz here on Joy News Prime. I am MFA Apao. There's more news when you log on to myjoyonline.com. That'll be all uh, for tonight's edition of Joy News Prime. At the top of the hour, eight, Beverly Broom has oh, 30 minutes of joy business with you. Please do stay.